الحمد لله وكفى السلام على عباده الذين استفى أما بعد أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم يوم لا ينفع مال ولا بنون إلا من أتى الله لك من السليم سبحان ربك رب العزة أما يصفون السلام على المرسلين والحمد لله رب العالمين اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد وعلى آل سيدنا محمد ومبارك وسلم اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد وعلى آل سيدنا محمد ومبارك وسلم Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given every one of us a body, a zahir, a jism, a jasad, a badan. <coughs> and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given each and every one of us a batin, an inner self. All of us are very well acquainted with our body. If we get slightly sick in our body, we can feel it. If it's the smallest cut and your smallest finger, you will feel it and you will be aware of it and you will want to get it cured. But we should have been equally aware of our bandit. And what if a small stain comes onto our kalb? What if a small sin affects our heart? What if a tiny impure thought comes to our mind? What if a bad desire comes inside our nafs? We should have been as acutely aware of our batin as we are of our zahir. In this day and age, we are so exclusively aware of our zahir. Always trying to go for the bodily pursuits. And we have very little time for the spiritual pursuits. And what did Allah SWT say in Quran? Yawma should remember that day, prepare for that day. Always live every moment in anticipation of that day and in the day of judgment. And how, what is the description of that day? La yanfa'uma That none of your wealth, none of your worldly possessions will be of any benefit to you. Wala manur And none of your sons, your offspring, none of your worldly relations will be of any benefit to you. The only one who will be successful on that day, who brings to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Man atallahu bi qalbin saleem Man that person, only that person, every such person who brings to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala a pure heart. We're so concerned with our outward purity. We look in the mirror so many times a day. We wash and scrub ourselves so many times. We have so many types of soaps and shampoos and creams and cosmetics. Hmm? Powders and deodorants and Fragrances. Hmm? What about what about our bathroom? What about that talib that we were supposed to bring to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that is sitting? <coughs> so you should know in your bathroom there's three aspects to your bathroom. One is your akal, which is your mind, the second is your nafs, and the third is your talib. So understand each of these three. Akal means your mind. Our mind was given to us so that we could fill it with the ilm of deen, with the ilm of wahi, with the ilm of Qur'an, with the ilm of sunnah. That mind that understands that this is the reason I exist is to fill myself up with the noor of ilm. Sayyidina Rasulullah Wasallam said, al ilm noor. Then that mind will be sound, that will be ugly sleep. But that mind that does not have the ilm of deen, the ilm of wahi, then that mind will have all types of other thoughts, all types of other ideas. <coughs> Everybody's mind has thoughts. Akal is the seed of your khyala. Akal is the seed of your khyala. Everyone who has a functioning mind will always be thinking something. All the time you will be thinking thoughts. Now some people have good thoughts and some people have bad thoughts. That's the only difference. Everybody is thinking thoughts. The choice is whether you have good thoughts or you have bad thoughts. Now one thing you will notice interesting about the mind, that sometimes thoughts come on their own. We're trying to think it, but it comes on its own. So sometimes we say in English, a thought popped up in my head. A thought cropped up in my head. Right? Okay. So understand what the <coughs> says about this. If a bad thought 
Bad means displeasing to Allah subhanahu ta'ala. Bad means unworthy of following the sunnah of Sayyidina Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa If a bad thought occurs to a person, just the occurrence of a bad thought, that's not a sin. But if when the bad thought occurs, then we start thinking about it, we dwell on it, we ruminate on it, we make it into what we call a train of thought, we start adding thought after thought after thought, fantasizing, etc. Each and every step of the way we will be getting sin after sin after sin. So that's how our Mashaikh explained it to Bure shalal ka ana us pe pakarne hoga. Bure shalal ko sochna un par jam jana us pe pakarogi. So shalal aate hain, ko jaane de. Thoughts come and go. You will notice many times you have a fleeting thought, passing thought, right? So this is one of the training that our Mashaikh gave. How to make sure that whenever the bad thought comes, you make sure it's just a passing thought. Just keep the traffic flowing. Don't let yourself dwell on that bad thought. And when the good thought comes, you want to grab that good thought. You want to latch onto that good thought. You want to keep thinking that good thought. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave us this mind which will always be thinking thoughts. You will also see that you will be thinking thoughts even during an activity. You have the ability to retain the thoughts called memory. For example, you leave your home and your wife tells you to buy some vegetables on the way back. Now, that thought comes into your mind when you hear her. That thought will stay there. <coughs> otherwise, if it had been otherwise, that the second somebody says, Salaam Alaikum to you, another thought comes, that thought leaves, you'd be in trouble when you went home. Allah Ta'ala made the human mind in such a way that you can think a thought and retain that thought even while doing other things such that a person will complete the entire activity whatever they set out for, maybe entire day's activity and still they will remember on the way home to get that item from the store. So why was this ability given to us? This ability was actually given to us so that we would always think Thoughts about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That no matter what activity we would be doing, we would retain some thoughts about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They're such real people. Mar the moment. True mu'mini. That even when they're engaged in material activity, the pursuit of this world, buying and selling trade and commerce, even then they cannot be distracted from the zikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala one drop, one second. What does that mean? It doesn't mean zikr on the tongue. That they're always saying tasbih. No, their tongue is busy buying, selling, negotiating, right? It's not zikr of the tongue. It's the zikr of the mind and zikr of the heart. They cannot empty themselves of thoughts of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala no matter what type of thoughts they're doing in this world. That's why Allah ta'ala gave us this mind. For the nur of the ilm, and to think thoughts of Allah SWT. Then, second part of us is called our nafs. Nafs is the seat of our desires. Nafs, khayshat ka markazin. Akum, khayalat ka markazin. Nafs is the seat of our desires. Again, some people have good desires. Some people will have bad desires. Some people nafs have bad desires. Inna nafs la ammar bisui. That indeed the nafs is overpoweringly commanding a person to do evil. And there's another type of nafs, nafs al mutmainna. That nafs has also desires, but it has only good desires. It only desires what Allah desires for it. Like they say in English, that your wish is my command. And we add to that, your wish is my command and your command is my wish. That's nafs al mutmainna. Talking to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Hmm? Allah ta'ala, your desire and wish is my command. And your command is my desire and wish. <laughs> I desire to pray salah. You don't have to tell me a salah to khair of Can you imagine my sin salah? Allah ta'ala, kitna hai mehr baan hai. Ye koi kehne wali baat thi. Is ki kehne ki zirud ki nobati kaise hai. How is it that we are so low that Allah ta'ala had to say this had to make the Muslims say it every single morning. As-salatu khairu minallah. A prayer is better than sleep. 
Every single morning the mother has to say that. To convince us to get up and talk to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Imagine if you had to say this to your wife, that every time you come home, you find her sleeping, you have to tell her that talking to me is better than sleeping. Imagine every time a wife had to say this to her husband, every single day, talking to me is better than sleeping. Say, so what type of relationship is this? Allah Akbar. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is so merciful. He's reaching out to us so much. He's telling us something that He should not have needed to tell us. A salatu khirum min al is a truth in of itself. <laughs> it doesn't even need to be stated. Hamitni kache. Mazan bhokta rata hai, bhokta rata hai, mustota rata hai, mustota rata For us, the opposite. Nafsa amara. An naumu khirum min al-salat. That's what nafsa amara feels. That for them sleeping in their comfortable bed is even better than praying in the mustota. Oh. Everybody has a nafs. Everyone has a nafs. Just a question, does the nafs have good desires or does the nafs have bad desires? The third thing that a person has in their bottom, that is called kalb. Kalb. Kalb means your seat of your emotions. Does not. Your emotions and feelings, they come from the kalb. Everyone has a kalb. Everybody has a spiritual heart. It's not your physical heart. Physical heart just pumps blood. It has nothing to do with feeling. This is the heart of your ruh. This is called Qalb in Qur'an by Allah SWT. And it's the seat of your feelings and emotions. Every feeling, every emotion. You have arrogance, it's in your Qalb. You have humility, it's in your Qalb. You have envy and jealousy, it's in your Qalb. You have goodwill and kindness and compassion, that's in your Qalb. You have love for the world, Qubbat Dunya, it's in your Qalb. You have love for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, ishqe lahi, it's in your kalb. All of the emotions and feelings are in the kalb. And of course then the most important feelings, either you have the feeling of iman, or you have the feeling of kufr, that is also in your kalb. Everyone who has a heart will have feelings and emotions. So every human being has feelings. Now what you should know is that in all of these three things, Qalb, Nafs, and Aqal, the control room is the Qalb. The Asl is the Qalb. What does it mean when the Aqal wants to decide what type of thoughts to think, it will look and see what's inside the Qalb. When the Nafs wants to decide what desires to have, it will look at what's inside the Qalb. The best way to explain this to you is through the master feeling of love. Let's say a person has love for dunya in their heart. So the uncle will see that, and they'll always be thinking about money, always be thinking about money, investment, savings, accounts, money, investment, savings, accounts, property, investment, savings, accounts. Love Akbar. <laughs> Saying these words so many times in the masjid is not even appropriate. Yeah? But that's because in the cult, the uncle is just looking at what's in the cult. <laughs> Akal cannot come up with these thoughts on its own. It takes its cue from the heart. That heart is both the dunya, so the akal will think thoughts accordingly. Or maybe there's somebody who has love outside of nikah, another type of love, another type of unlawful love outside nikah. So when akal wants to decide what to think about, they look at their kal and they find her. <laughs> so what will akal be thinking about? Just having thoughts of her all the time. Day and night, thoughts and thoughts and thoughts and thoughts. Because we're looking at what was inside the cup. And yes, you could also have a person. <coughs> what do they have inside their cup? When the uncle looks inside the cup, what emotion do they find? This person has a feeling of overwhelming love for Allah SWT. So this person's uncle, now they're the ones who will think about Allah SWT. They will have pure thoughts, sometimes they're thinking about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, sometimes they're thinking about Makkah Makarma, sometimes they're thinking about Medina Manawara, sometimes they're thinking about some Sahaba, sometimes they're thinking about some Hadith they heard. All the time this is what's on their mind. Why? Because that what was in their heart. That was what was in their heart. Similarly, the nafs, nafs is also going to look at the kalb. If the nafs finds in the kalb a love for the world, 
then that will be a person of desires. All of their desires, I want more money, I want a bigger house, I want a better car, I want a better phone. All of their desires will be based on whatever feeling they find in the heart. And if they had the love for unlawful ghairullah outside nikah, the nafs will see that, and the nafs will have all types of desires, unspeakable desires. Say something. The nafs will have all types of desires. It's just following what's inside the heart. And if, mashallah, that person in their heart, in their belly, they have love for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then the nafs will have those types of desires. <coughs> so the desire, I wish I could become hafiz. Okay, I wish I could learn more Qur'an. Oh, I wish I could understand Qur'an. These will be all their wishes and desires. I wish I could pray to Hajjul. Hmm? I wish I could become a person of sabr. I wish I could improve my dhikr. These will be all their desires. I wish I could learn more about the sunnah. I wish I desire to know more about the seerah. But all their desires will be based on what's in their heart. So if it means that the kalb is the asal, then why not we should purify our heart? Because if you purify the kalb, the nafs and akal will automatically become pure. So if you want to know how to have pure thoughts, and you want to know how to have pure desires, very simple, you have to make your heart have pure emotions. If you can work on your kalb to have pure emotions, everything else will fall into place. This is why you will see that in Qur'an al when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions the Anbiya wa Mursaleen, the Prophets, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends, he says, that he sends wahi down on their kalb. So what did Allah ta'ala, where did he send the wahi onto their kalb? After the kalb, everything else falls into place. And an ordinary believer, what did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say in Quran? May yu'min billahi yahdi qalbuhu. That that person who has iman in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah ta'ala sent hidayah on their kalb. When the Anbiya used to speak to people, what would they be addressing? They weren't giving rational arguments and addressing people's akal. They weren't talking about the level of desires. All of the Prophets, alayhi salam ajma'in, they were addressing the qulub, the spiritual hearts of the people. And those ulama, al ulama al anbiya those ulama who are the inheritors of the Prophets in this aspect, that they address the hearts, they are called awliya. Quran, they're called Siddiqeen in Quran, they also address the Qulub, the hearts of the people. So why not we should put our heart in front of such a heart? Why not we should put all of our effort onto our heart? Why not we should try to purify our heart and try to spend our life trying, even if we die trying, to get that golden sunni? So now I want to show you from Quran that there are different types of heart that Allah SWT has mentioned in the Qur'an. The first type of heart mentioned in the Qur'an, you can call it the dead heart. Yes, dead heart. Different types of human beings have this dead heart. First, there are some people's hearts who don't have any Iman Allah SWT at all. It's called an atheist, a mulkin. That means their qalb is empty of the nur of Iman they will have a dead heart. Second is that type of heart who believes in a supreme being. You'll find people like that in society. They say, generally I believe in a supreme being, but they don't believe in Sayyidina Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. That's called a dead heart. For disbeliever, they will also have a dead heart. Third is another type of person who says, I believe in multiple beings, multiple gods, al mushrik. That person also will have a dead heart. Fourth, you will have another type of heart, person, who pretends to believe on their tongue, but really doesn't believe in their heart, monafik. That person also has a dead heart. So whether it's mulhid, whether it's kafir, whether it's mushrik, whether it's monafik, all such people have a dead heart. So in Arabic you can call this, kalam al the dead heart. And listen to what Allah SWT has mentioned in Quran about this. What does it mean? They have a heart. Not like they have the color. It's inside of them. But it's dead. Dead. Not functional. Not functional. And inside the color, maybe I should explain. 
in the Kalba, inside the Kalba there's something called Fu'ad. Another word that comes in Arabic and put on for heart. Fu'ad is the core of the Kalba. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what did he say in Quran? Inna sam'a wal basara wal fu'ada Kullu ula'ika kana anhu mas'oola That every single thing, the person's mm, hearing, the person's seeing, and the person's heart, everything will be asked about by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the day of judgment. Allah subhanahu is going to ask us how we used our ears, what we listened to, how we used our eyes, what we looked at, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to examine us and ask us about our heart. What feelings did we allow ourselves to feel? Allah Akbar. Many people think that, no, I'm only going to be liable for action. That as long as I don't do the sin, I'll be safe. No. If in your heart you have a feeling of sin, you will be asked. That's why once last year I explained this to you. Whether it was wa batina that you have to leave all of the sins, the zahir sins and the batin sins. For example, all of you know famous hadith of Sayyidina Rasulullah Wasallam that no one will ever land, land, no one will ever ever enter Jannah if they have a drop, an atom, a zarra of the kabur in their heart. When the hadith is come, what's the, that's a feeling, that's not an action, that's a feeling. They have a feeling of hasad, feeling of the kabur. So Allah is going to ask us on the day of judgment about our feelings. Now one way Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions this kalb in Qur'an is the blind heart. This heart is blinded. But Allah is saying in Qur'an, It's not their eyes that are blind, they can see. It's their kudub, it's their spiritual hearts that are inside their breasts. It's that which has become blind. This is for the Qalbun Mayat. They cannot perceive the reality of Allah SWT. They have blind heart. So one example is dead heart. One example is blind heart. So what is the sign of such a person? Right? So I want you to see that the signs what if we find any of these signs inside us? Kalbun Mates is supposed to be the heart of unbelief, right? But now I'm going to tell you it's signs, the alabat. The signs that a person has a dead heart. And what we should ask is, do I have the same signs inside of me? Even though, even though I have Iman, do I actually have the symptoms and signs of a dead heart? So first thing, first sign that a person has a dead heart is because the heart is dead and the nafs is completely free. Nafs not taking cue from anything. So what does that mean? The nafs is going to pursue any and all of its desires and this person, when their desire is fulfilled, they're happy. And when their desire is not fulfilled, they're sad. That's the sign they have a dead heart. They're just a creature of their desires. And they say, a slave to their desires. If their desires, khayshal puri hoti hai if a person is like that, that whatever I wish and desire, when that happens, I'm happy. And whatever I wish and desire, when that doesn't happen, I'm unhappy. That is a sign and symptom that a person has a dead heart. For example, you will see in societies like the one we live in, where there is no taqwa, where there is no concept of iman, they're just fulfilling every desire that they want. Shamelessly, it doesn't matter. Without any remorse, without any regret, without any haya, without any modesty, without any shame, any and every lustful desire. They will make any and every attempt, even debase themselves to do it. And if they're successful that night, then they're happy that night. And if they're unsuccessful that night, then they're sad that night. <laughs> they don't look at their izza, they don't look at their haya, they don't look at their honor, they don't look at dignity, they look at nothing. Just simply looking that is my desire fulfilled or not. No inside marriage, outside marriage, during marriage. Nothing made anything to them. Oh, okay. Why? Because they just want to fulfill their desire. Second sign of the dead heart is that a person feels no hesitation in doing so. No hesitation. No hesitation. No regrets. No remorse. Nothing. If there's any sin like that that me and you do without hesitation, 
Maybe we're alone at night and we do a sin without any hesitation. No hesitation whatsoever. And Allah tells in the Quran, Man khashya rahmana bil ghayb. Bil ghayb means when Allah Ta'ala is unseen. What does that mean? One way that means is when you're alone with Allah Ta'ala. What does that mean? That there's no such thing as being alone. You can never be alone. You can be alone in the sense that there are no human beings around you. When you're alone in that sense, what does it mean? You are one on one with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's how you should feel. That's how you should feel when you're alone. Me and Allah ta'ala, we are one on one. In this room it's just me and Allah ta'ala's awareness of me, His ilm of me, His gaze on me. That's what it means to be alone. So that's why Quranic mu'min, when they were like that, what would they feel? Khashiyah, khashiyah. They would feel fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They would be afraid, <laughs> they would be humbled in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And what attribute of Allah ta'ala would they be thinking about? Is it Man Khashil Aziza? No. Man Khashil Jabbara? No. Man Khashil Rahman? Ya Allah, <laughs> this Quranic insan, he's thinking about you as Al Rahman. He's thinking about you, that you're infinitely merciful, all merciful, and what is the feeling he has in his qalb of khashiyah? Imagine such a person. <laughs> mean you think that Allah Ta'ala being a Rahman means you don't have to fear him. Allah Ta'ala is saying in Qur'an, Man khashiyah Rahman. Now this person, if they have fear, for Allah Ta'ala, when they think about him as a Rahman, can you imagine what would happen to this person's heart when they think about Allah Ta'ala as Al-Aziz? Al-Jambar, Al-Mutakabbir, Zul-Jalal, Zul-Intikam, Al-Qahar. What would happen to this person's heart? It's already melted in fear when they're thinking about Allah Ta'ala Al-Rahman. How far are we from Qur'an? That's the real question we should be asking ourselves every day. The reality of Qur'an, the feelings of Qur'an, the haqiqat of Qur'an. Man al-Khashir Rahman al that person has a lot of hesitation. <laughs> a lot of hesitation before they sin. But they have a dead heart. Which means they don't feel that khashiyya. When they're alone, they're fearless. They were supposed to have been fearful. But if when they're alone, they're fearless, then that means they have a dead heart. <coughs> dead heart. Sign of dead heart. Third sign is that doing a'mal salih, good deeds, Acts of worship, or acts of piety, acts of ibadah, or acts of virtue, is a burden on them. Important. It's very difficult for them. You can't do it. You tell them to read Quran every day, and they can't do it. You tell them to make a stick far every day, and they can find it difficult. You tell them to try to pray Fajr every day for a month, difficult. Acts of Ibana, Amal Saleh, acts of virtue are a burden on them. They find it difficult. That's the sign of a dead heart. That's the sign of a dead heart. If the heart was alive for the love for Allah subhanahu ta'ala, they would find it easy. They would say, oh, I would love to, I could spend all my time worshipping Allah subhanahu ta'ala. It's just out of necessity that I have to work. It's out of necessity I go to the university. Otherwise, my emotional state is I could easily spend hours and hours reading Qur'an. Sometimes a young man, so today was Friday, Jummah, sometimes even he makes the knee and said, okay, I'll read Surah Kahaf. And he opens it and he reads one page, two page, then it gets difficult on him. He can't do it. Then he reads the third page, it's still difficult. Allah Akbar, then what does he do? He scans ahead and sees how many pages are left. He sticks his finger there, and now he reads with as much speed as possible. Means as little feeling as possible. Reads as fast as he can, and he keeps watching, when am I going to reach the finger? When he turns the page, reaches, sees the finger, knows he's about to end, then he feels the feeling of joy. He is reading Quran like it's a burden. And that's the one who's actually even doing it. <laughs> that's the one who even actually recited to Rakaf when he recites it like that, like it's a burden on him. What was this mistake? Why did I have this idea that I should read this surah? I'm stuck. If anybody has anything remotely like that, 
means a person has a dead heart. <laughs> These are the signs of having a dead heart. Fourth sign that our Mashaika mentioned, that a person has a dead heart, is that they don't like advice. They don't like it. They don't like to hear counsel and advice. Sometimes in Urdu, Allah Akbar, they have ways to keep indulge your women. Oh, gee, kisi ki pair bhi nahi karna. Oh, kisi ki pair bhi nahi karna. Kisi ki baat maanne ki zarurat nahi hai. Hmm? Oh, but, but does it mean English? That there's no need to follow anyone. There's no need to listen to anyone. They come up with this philosophy. There's no need to follow anyone. There's no need to listen to anyone. So that means that they're following and listening to one is their one nafs and their one shaitan. <laughs> Every single human being is following someone. <laughs> Whether they choose to follow the Nabiin, Siddiqeen, Salihin, or they choose to follow their nafs and the shaitan, that's the only choice. Every human being has been created a follower. Every human being is a listener. But they don't like it. They don't like to hear the see. Amazing Sayyidina Rasulullah some said hadith, Ad-Deen An-Nasiha. Ad-Deen An-Nasiha. Those in the Arabic, they know, Tarif Al-Tarifayn Yufid Al-Hasan. Ad-Deen and An-Nasiha means Ad-Deen, all of Deen lies in good advice and counsel. All good advice and sincere counsel equals Deen. How could this person say that I don't need to listen to anyone? When the Prophet is saying is Deen is all about giving and listening to Nasiha. Nasiha is a living tradition. It's not about reading books. Nasiha in reality is a living tradition. But then they say, I don't want to follow anyone. You make no every day in Surah Fatih to follow. When you ask Allah Ta'ala, Ihdina Siratul Mustaqeem. Allah Ta'ala give me Hidayat to Siratul Mustaqeem. What did you say? You said Siratul Nadina. Sirat al-Nadina, al-Nadina, he puts logo ka rasta hai. He's the best in it. Sirat al-Nadina means the path of some people, of those people. So you're asking Allah Ta'ala to guide you to Hidayah, to guide you to a path of people. Which people? Al-Nadina, an-amta alayhim. Those people who you, Allah Ta'ala, you're happy with them. You sent your favors and blessings on them. Who are they? Allah Ta'ala explains in another ayah of Quran. الَّذِينَ أَنْعَمَ اللَّهُ مِنَ النَّبِيِّينَ وَالسِّدِّكِينَ وَشُفَدَاءِ وَالصَّالِحِينَ And who are they? They are the Prophets, the Siddiqeen, the truest followers of the Prophets, the Shuhada, the ones who give their lives for the Deen, the martyrs, and Salihin, and the righteous ones. Every day in Surah Fatiha, so many times in Salah, you are asking Allah Ta'ala, Allah Ta'ala, make me a follower of Nabiyeen and Siddiqeen and Shuhada and Salihin. That's if anybody even wants to tell you this, that you should only follow Hadith, that's against the Quran. Yeah, because Quran is saying you have to follow Nabiyeen, and obviously Sayyidina Rasulullah says Hadith, but Quran is saying you have to also follow Siddiqeen, and you have to follow Shuhada, and you have to follow Salihin. That's Quran is saying that. But they don't. But the person with the dead heart, they don't like that. They flee from any such concept. They want to be left alone on their own. They don't like to hear advice. The young man doesn't like it. Even his own brother, to find the parents give up, they go to the older brother. They say, you explain to him. His own blood brother goes to him and tries to gently explain to him. He won't listen. He'd rather go out with a complete stranger who SMSs himself, pick you up. He'll get in the car and go out with strangers or friends he met one day ago. And he'll spend all night with them and be best buddies with them. He won't listen to his own brother. He doesn't want to see him. He doesn't want to see him. Oh, so that's the fourth sign that a person has this dead heart. Another way Allah Ta'ala mentioned this heart of Quran is the hard heart. So first we had blind heart, now we have the hard heart of the thoughts in the Qur'an. ثُمَّ قَسَلْ قُلُوبُكُمْ مِنْ بَعْدِ ذَلِكَ فَهِيَ كَالْحِجَالِتَ أَوْ أَشَدُّ قَسْفَةً That then their hearts became hardened after that. And their hearts are hard like rocks. No, in fact they're even harder than rocks. Because then Allah Ta'ala says that don't you see from the rocks, boulders, or even water and springs can gush forth. But this person's heart is so hard, it's even harder than a rock. What the 
talking about physical heart. <laughs> talking about bones, spiritual heart. So the dead heart, that's a term the Messiah used. The blind heart, mentioned in the Quran, and the hard heart, mentioned in the Quran. So hard, that it doesn't feel the sting of sin. Yes? If you were to sleep through an exam, you would be crying. If you were to sleep through your court case, you would be crying. If your boss told you there's a meeting at 9 a.m., you have to be there. And you sleep through it, you would be crying. But if we sleep through Fajr, no crying. Hard heart. We've, okay, we slept through it again. Second time, still no crying. Third time, still no crying. Sometimes young men, they go through these ups and downs. All of a sudden they pray Fajr for five, ten days. Then all of a sudden they say, for ten days I missed Fajr. And then I'm amazed that Abkuya kiss and Dasi about what you can't say. They just say it as if they're saying, you know, they skipped their tea for ten days. They should have said it with tears in their eyes. They should have been begging me to teach them a way to pray Fajr. They just say it casually. Just by the way. They'll come and say, oh, can you help me? I think magic has been done on me. I can't get married, this, that, the other. At the end, Jadeva. Oh, you know, there's one more thing. Ji, now I've prayed Fajr for 10, 15. Oh, one more thing. Hello. Hmm? That's the state. That's the state of a person. That's where our Shaykh used to teach us. That don't ask why I can't wake up for Fajr. Don't ask the question. Why am I unable to make a professor? Ask the question, why does my Allah Ta'ala not want to see my face in Fajr? The Messiah can teach us to understand You learn how to understand life in deep. It's a totally different question. It changes your experience. That will make a person cry. Why I can't wake up for Fajr, that will make you cry. You say, oh, I sleep, I'm sleepy. Head. Ask yourself this question. Why does my Allah Ta'ala not want to see my face at Fajr? That'll make you cry. Yes? <laughs> and for those who are more men, why does Allah Ta'ala not want my name to be written on the ranks of those who call upon Him in love and passion? Why is it Allah Ta'ala every night strikes my name off the list of His lovers? And those who are more men, they should ask this question. They shouldn't ask if you also directly cancer to Jatta. Uh -huh. Yeah, that's what you should ask. So this was the first type of heart. Hmm? Once somebody came to say, "No, for Sheikh Hassan of Basra, the greatest Tami," and he said to him, "To Sheikh, I'm worried that my heart is sleeping." He said, what? He said, because when you tell ayat of Qur'an, you say, Qala Allahu Ta'ala. When you say the words of Sayyidina Rasulullah, Qala Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, it doesn't have an effect on me. I'm worried that my heart is sleeping. Sayyid Hassan Basri Ta'ala said that, oh young man, you shouldn't be worried that your heart is sleeping. You should be worried that your heart is dead. Because when something is sleeping, you shake it, it wakes up. If your heart was sleeping and the Quran, words of Quran came on it, words of the Hadith came on it, it would have woken up. If you still didn't wake up, it means it's not sleeping, it means it's dead. <laughs> so the first type of Qalm is called Qalm al Dead heart. There's a second type of Qalm. That is called Qalm al Also mentioned in the Quran. That means the sick heart, the diseased heart, the sinful believer's heart. The sinful believer's heart. Allah Ta'ala mentioned this in Quran. Jeeb ayah. Ya Nisa'an Nabi, Lastunna ka ahalim minan nisa'i That, O Mahatul Mu'mineen, O wives of Prophet Salam, You are not like any ordinary woman. No single one of you is like any ordinary woman. In it, the Kaytunna, Falatna bil Oli, that if you were to have taqwa, hmm, then you should not soften your voice. You should not speak in a hmm, soft tone. You should not speak in a soft tone. Why? Fayatma alladi, fayatma alladi, fi kalbihi marad. 
Fi kalbihi manan Ya Allah This ayah is coming down in Quran Who are the women? Umahatu mu'mineen Sahabiyat Not even any sahabiyat Umahatu mu'mineen Who are the men? Sahaba ikram And Allah Ta'ala is laying down So if you want to know what does Islam say about gender interaction You should read this ayah This ayah is the first and last ayah you will need on the whole discussion don't even soften your voice. Why? Because that person, the Kalbihim that person who has the diseased heart, they will have tama. Oh, they will have lust, they will have a yearning for you. That means if any women are listening, that means that if they have to pick up the phone at home, they should not be rude, but they should have a. Mm, Curt, to the point, huh? professional, professional voice. And the men should also do amal on this. The amazing thing we see the men in England, they talk to the women in their home so sternly, and they talk to all the non-Muslim women so softly. It's amazing when we look at you in the stores. You're so sweet to that cashier, so sweet to the stewardess, hmm? so sweet to the nurse. So sweet, the love of mercy. And when you're all home, the love of mercy. So stern. And the women complain. He comes home with a stern countenance. Hmm? And you want me to tell her, oh, you should have seen him right now. Just, just with the woman cashier, you should have seen him. The love of mercy. Hmm? Oh, you should be brief to the point, professional, curt. The report about you, the boss should not give the report that, oh, Abdullah is so nice and so friendly and so talkative and all the colleagues love him. No, no, no. What should the report be? Abdullah is quiet, reserved, keeps to himself. Yes, that's the report you should get. He's quiet, reserved, keeps to himself, diligent, hard worker, gets the job done, but quiet, reserved, keeps to himself. Why did you think that for the sake of dunya you also had to be the most friendly person in that office or the most friendly person in that business or the most friendly person in that store with the women? That's it. Not like that. Not like that. So here, second type of heart in Quran is Kalbun Marid. Maybe you can understand this simply. This person has Oh, fluctuation. Sometimes, when you look at them, they look that they are like, Oh, they are Rahman. Oh, they're crying in the They're making ibadah. They will spend a few days in the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They may travel a few days with their shaykh. They may go for umrah. They may go for hajj. Sometimes they're like that. And other times, Allah Akbar, they're like, Oh, they are shaitan. Sometimes when they're alone, the overwhelming power of lust overcomes them and they lose themselves. Sometimes they fall into anger. Sometimes they fall into backbiting. Sometimes they have a feeling of hasad towards someone. They're They have the root of iman and they have the darkness of sin. They have a sick heart. Hmm? That's the word Allah used in Quran. Mara. Fi kalbihi maradun min sikh. Now tell me, when you get physically sick, what do you do? You go to a doctor. When you get physically sick, you want to get treated. <coughs> so how important would it be then that if we're spiritually sick, to go to a spiritual doctor, to get spiritually treated, to get the spiritual cure? <coughs> Recently I was explaining to some people that even if you're slightly sick, the example we gave, was that imagine if you lose the sense in your tongue. Your tongue becomes unfeeling. You cannot tell anymore between hot and cold. You cannot tell between sweet and sour. What would you do? You'd go to a doctor. And you'd be so worried about this. If the doctor told you that no, it's okay, your heart is fine, lungs is fine, kidney is fine, don't worry. You say, doctor, my tongue has lost its feeling. I cannot taste when I eat. I don't even want to have one meal like that but I'm not able to taste. Are you so worried about the unfeeling tongue? When will you worry about the unfeeling heart? 
If you're worried about the paralysis of the tongue, what are you going to worry about the paralysis of your spiritual heart? If you wouldn't want to even eat one morsel unfeeling, why are you willing to pray one rakat unfeeling? Why are you willing to make one sadda unfeeling? Why are you willing to say one surat al fatiha unfeeling? How can you even say one Allahu Akbar unfeeling? And nobody's worried about that. Kalb is unfeeling. No problem. Life goes on. Anything else, even your one pinky became paralysis. I have to give you paralysis of the pinky. Hmm? Everything else is fine. And you say, no, but the pinky. <laughs> I'm not feeling it. You go to doctor and doctor and doctor. Huh? But paralysis of the gulb, disease of the gulb, cancer of the gulb. Fine. No problem. Oh, huh? So the second type of gulb was the diseased gulb, the sick gulb. Now, you should think, if you don't get this cure, what's going to happen? Even though technically this eye was originally about the Munafikin and Kufar, but the ulama of the Sir has said that every eye in Quran it has a womb in it, unless clearly otherwise. So what does Allah Sallallahu say in Quran? فِي قُلُوبِهِمْ بَرَضٍ فَزَادَهُمُ اللَّهُ بَرَضٍ That they have an illness in their heart, right? That's for real nifaq, but there's another type of nifaq, that's us. Outwardly we say we have iman, but inwardly we don't have the feelings of iman. Outwardly we're praying, but inwardly we're thinking about something else. So it could be about that type of nifaq also. They have an illness in their heart and they don't try to cure it. So what's going to happen? Allah SWT is going to increase them in that illness. Now, if you have a physical illness and it gets increased, 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 what's the worst that can happen? You can end up in physical death. But if you have a spiritual illness and that gets increased, 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 then what will happen? You will have spiritual death. Yes? <laughs> One will have spiritual death. Then they will go right back to that dead heart. So we should want to clean our heart. Yes, clean the diseased heart. These days we spend so much time cleaning our homes. Women spend so much time cleaning the bathroom. Spick and span bathroom which is a place of Najasa. And you can't make your gulb spick and span which is the place of Iman and the nur of Iman. You couldn't make your gulb spick and span the place where the gaze of Allah Ta'ala falls, the hidai of Allah Ta'ala falls on it. If we get one stain on our clothing, we want to wash it away. Huh? We run to the bathroom and quickly wash it so it doesn't get permanently stained. And we get the stain of sin on our gullum and we're not even bothered. Stain after stain after stain. The young man will get down on his knees and scrub the wheels and rims and tires of his car. Huh? But he cannot scrub his tongue with the ibadat and istighfar of Allah SWT. So the first type of heart was the dead heart. Second type of heart was the sick heart. And Alhamdulillah there's a third type of heart. And that's called Qalbun Salim. It's also a type of heart. <laughs> that's the pure heart. The best heart. The living heart. The heart that is full of the nur of Iman, the heart that is full with the love for Allah subhanahu ta'ala. So full with the love for Allah subhanahu ta'ala that there is no room for unlawful love to come in. No room. That's why Allah said you have to be ashadda hubbalillah. You have to be so intensely overwhelmed in your love for Allah subhanahu ta'ala that your heart is completely occupied with Allah subhanahu ta'ala. There's no room for anything else. You will see that whenever you have some worry or some difficulty or some exam or some court case, you're completely occupied with that. There's no room for anything else. You can't have any other thought. The mu'min was supposed to have their heart so full of the love for Allah subhanahu ta'ala that there was no room left for anything else. The only those loves that can coexist with his love. It is al-hubbu fillah, lillah, love in his name, love for his sake, love of those things that he loves, love that he has made permissible. They could live along with that, but nothing else could enter to that person's heart. So to understand what Qalbun Salim is, we're going to just explain to you using one hadith. 
And from that one hadith of Sayyidina Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, you understand what are those pure feelings that live in that pure heart. So this is one sentence hadith at the beginning. Man ahabba lillah. That person who loves for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, loves in the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is another sign. If you want, you can give the sign of the pure heart. Sayyidina Rasulullah sallallahu said in the Sahih and on the Day of Judgment, there will be seven types of people who will be lucky enough to get the shade of the arsh of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the shade of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. One of those people, Humul Mutahabuna Filah, those who love one another just for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They have no other relation with one another. They're strangers to one another. They can become from different countries from one another. They only and only love one another for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is it. It also means that all their loves are the, on the basis of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They cannot love anything that Allah ta'ala doesn't love. And they cannot but love everything that Allah ta'ala does love. Complete alignment. Yes? Man Allah. What Allah loves, they love. What Allah SWT dislikes, they dislike. What Allah SWT detests, they detest. They cannot love something that Allah doesn't want them to love. That's perfectly aligned heart. God of Talmud Salim. Man Allah. Second, and you find this in Sahaba Ikram by the greatest example. Sahaba Ikram by the Allah Ta'ala Anhum Ajma'i. They were living embodiments of this Qalab al hmm? All of their love became for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala once they accepted him. Second part of the day is, Allah And their dislike, and their hatred, and their detest things, only and only for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So example of this from the Ummahat al-Mu'mineen, Ummah Habib al-Radiyallahu ta'ala anha. She was the daughter of Abu Sufyan. And so once Abu Sufyan, he came to visit her in her home. And he traveled some time to visit her. So when he came in, she greeted him, he greeted her. And then he wanted to sit down. So when she saw that he wanted to sit down, she rolled up the bed and made him sit on the naked rope. And so he said that, oh my daughter, when the father comes, people lay out the bedding. They don't roll it up. And she said, yes, you are my father, but this is that same bedding upon which Sayyidina Rasulullah Wasallam sits, and you don't have iman yet, so you're not worthy to sit on this bedding. Allah Akbar. You see? Not They dislike things for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Hmm? Oh, this is the daughter-father relationship, right? So what does this mean? You should also, don't be misunderstand. Bogus is never for the person. Even for kufr, we have dislike for kufr. We have no dislike for any kufr. We dislike the feeling of kufr. We have no dislike for the person who has kufr. Deen of Islam has taught us different ways of feeling. One is how to feel about that kufr. We have deep dislike for kufr. Because it's a delusion, it's a deception, it's a tragedy. Everyone in this world dislikes it for tragedy to happen. For any human being to have unbelief, it's a tragedy. So we dislike kufr. But how does Islam treat us, teach us, to view the kafir? We view them with compassion. We view them with invitation. They are the object of our dawah. <laughs> we don't dislike them. We try, we're supposed to try to win them over somehow. It's the kufr that we dislike. It's not the person. Interesting thing about our deen. That's why Allah said in the Quran, وَعَافِينَ عَنِ النَّاسِ they swallow their anger. And they forgive humanity. Not Ma'afina al They forgive all of humanity. The our Quran teaches us to be forgiving towards humans, but severely we dislike the kufr. So Allah and they dislike for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It reminds me of another story of Sayyidina Abu Bakr Siddiq with Allah Ta'ala Anhu. His son was in Badr against his father. So later on, the son took Imam. 
And he was later on in life sitting and telling his father that, you know, and brother, twice you came within my sword's reach, but I didn't strike you because you were my father. He immediately, son's moment at this point, they're just reminiscing. Immediately said, Hamid Bakr Singh said that, oh my son, if you had come even once within my sword's reach, I would not have hesitated to strike you down. Why? Because on that day you came to try to slaughter my Nabi Yukim Sallallahu on that day you came to try to slaughter Sahaba Ikram. Allah Akbar. Ji? So, Man ahabba lillah wa abgha lillah third wa ada'a lillah That they give only and only for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Only to earn the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala They don't do so out of riyah, they don't do so for name, for show, for display, to get their name on the masjid huh? They don't give like that they give only and only for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Interesting story of one of the awliyaullah, Abu Umar Rajayr, rahimahullah ta'ala. He was very wealthy and very generous. And one day the ruler of his area, the Muslim ruler, presented a need. So the ummah was going through a difficult financial time. And there was a need to make something like you can call it a public work, something for the civil works. So he needed money. So... Abu Umar Rajayat, he gave 2 lakh, 200,000 dinars. Two, which is an incredible amount. 200,000 dinars. The next day, the ruler gathered the people and told them that, Alhamdulillah, we're now going to be able to begin that task that we needed to do, that everybody needed. And all of this is thanks to Abu Umar who gave 200,000 dinars. Oh, everybody was so amazed and they all turned and looked at Abu Umar. And they're looking at him with such amazement, and such love, and such respect. And Masulullah, look, he gave all this money, and everything will now be taken care of. Abu Umar, he saw that everybody's looking at him. So he stood up and he said, Oh ruler, actually yesterday I didn't tell you that, and made this intention to give you the money. But actually my mother, she has a share in the money, and I did not consult her. So I regret to inform you, I will have to take the money back. Now again everybody looked at him but with a different look. <laughs> everybody again looked at him with a different look. And then the gathering ended and people dispersed and the ruler waited and the ruler called Abu Umar and said, You embarrassed me so much today. What's the matter with you? <laughs> How can you give something and then take it back the next day? Abu Umar told him that no ruler, it's you who embarrassed me today. Who told you to tell anyone that I gave you the money? Here's the 200,000 dinar, you keep it, but don't tell anybody I give it to you. Allah will bring you. Imagine somebody like that. SubhanAllah. Man Allah. They gave only and only for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They didn't seek anything in this world. And the last part of this hadith, wa mana Allah. And what does that mean that they would? Hmm. Refuse the things of this world. They would leave the things of this world for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They wouldn't <coughs> do it for the sake of anything else. So a good example of that is Sayyidina Umar bin Abdul Aziz, <coughs> his wife, her name was Fatima. She was the daughter of a very wealthy man. And when she married him, Umar bin Abdul Aziz himself was very wealthy. But then he was bestowed upon the Khilafah. And when he became Amir al-Mu'mineen, so he sat his wife down and he told her that, look, my understanding of this position is that now I myself belong to Baytullah. And if you are my wife, everything that you have also belongs to Baytullah. So if you're willing to part with all of your wealth and riches that you have from your father and even what I have given you, then you can stay my wife. And if you don't want to, then no problem, we can go our separate ways. What did she say? Mashallah, she knew what type of husband she had. So she said, no, no, I can part with all of the riches and wealth that I have. I cannot part with you as a husband. And she gave up everything for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Some women like that in history. Hmm? So this is the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa this person and their Imam has become perfect. This person's Imam has become complete. This person has reached the highest level of Imam. Highest level of Imam. Now, last thing to tell you is what are the signs of a living heart in the Hadith? 
Number one, at the jafi and dalu that this heart becomes weary of the dunya. The heart is tired of the dunya. The heart does not enjoy the dunya. That's the sign of Kalbam Saling. Wal inabiti illa dar al And the heart is yearning towards the eternal abode. The heart is always thinking about the akhirah. The heart is always dreaming and yearning. When will I enter into akhirah? That's the sign of Kalbam Saling. Third, was to dadu the mauti kabla nazuli. The person is prepared for death before death comes to them. That they are prepared for death, their heart is ready to die. Their heart is ready to die. Oh, how many of us have a heart like that? That we can say our heart is ready to die. Hmm? Reminds me of another thing our Sheikh says. I'll tell you first one sentence explains so much in English that we have not been sent to this world to live a good life. We have not been sent to this world to live a good life. We have been sent to this world to die a good death. It's a totally different way of thinking. <laughs> this is what we get from our Mishnah. The Jeep. We have not been sent to this world to live a good life. We've been sent to this world to die a good death. How many of us are busy trying to live a good life? And how many of us are busy trying to die a good death? <coughs> that person has Kalbun Saleem they are able to die of good death. That person who has Kalbun Saleem, their heart's desire is that they just want to die of good death. That's it. That person with Kalbun Saleem, if somebody would give them a certificate today, that you, if you want to go today, you will die of good death, they will take it and they say, take me today. <laughs> if you can give me that certificate, then I can achimot marsakta ad marnikliyatya. Ek dare ki saad achimot namo. Koi guarantee de de. We've not been sent on this earth to die a good life, live a good life. We've been sent to this earth to die a good death. What is the greatest way to get that golden serene? That is to fill your heart with the love for Allah subhanahu wa and the love for Sayyidina Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa In the hadith of Bukhari, one Sahaba, he was called, this is in Haddeh, Oh, had the shirt of khumar. That one Sahaba was called one Sahaba. One sahaba. Here, don't want you to misunderstand the deed. But one Sahaba was caught drinking, and he was brought in front of Sayyidina Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi And it turns out he was a repeat offender. Yes, he had been caught and punished before, and he was caught and again punished this time. And Sayyidina Rasulullah Sallallahu was sad when he saw that the Sahaba was punished again. So the other, other Sahaba were watching this and one of those other Sahaba, he got upset. That this Sahabi, he's hurting the heart of the Prophet he got caught again on the sin. So this other Sahaba, he couldn't control himself. He cursed that Sahaba. Cursed him. That accursed are you that you hurt the heart of the Prophet Right? Now listen to the words of Adi. But to say that Rasulullah, he's also saying, as soon as the Prophet heard this, he said, La Don't you dare curse him. Wallahi, I swear by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Alim tu annahu yuhibbu Allah wa rasul. I swear by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I know that he loves Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he loves Sayyidina Rasulullah. What does it mean? It doesn't mean love for Allah ta'ala, love for the Prophet allows you to sin. But it means that that person in their heart, if they have love for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they have love for Sayyidina Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, then eventually that love will prevail. 
that love will dominate. That love will bring that person out to sin, and that is why the Mashayak of Tazki and Tasawwuf, they're always pushing us towards these two loves that increase your heart and your love for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, increase your heart and the love for Sayyidina Rasulullah because if you can fill your heart with that, sooner or later, slower or faster, inshallah you will make that journey towards Qalbul Sunnah. This is our du'a to Allah subhanahu ta'ala that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala increases in our love for Him and our love for Sayyidina Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa And the other way our Mashai explain is that they teach us some the dhikr. <coughs> that by doing dhikrullah, you will be able to purify your heart. So what is the emotion required to purify the heart? Love for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and love for the Prophet sallallahu What is the action required to purify the heart? The dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ya ayyuhalladheena amanu thukrullaha dhikran kathir That oh you have iman, you must make a lot of zikr of Allah SWT And Sayyidina Rasulullah SAW said Yaqul the shaykh al-sikalatul That for everything there is a polish The sikalatul kulubi al-dhikrullah And the polish of the hearts and the zikr of Allah SWT So before Isha Salaam We're going to teach you some zikr Then after Isha Salaam We'll make the one So the way to learn zikr is you need a teacher for zikr. <coughs> one is to read about zikr, to hear about zikr, to do zikr on your own. That's like to pick up a book of Qaeda and to read and to hear about the read and to learn the read on your own. Father Sahib will tell you, it's not going to happen. 99.999% of this ummah will only be able to learn Tajweed if they have a teacher for Tajweed. 99.999% of the Ummah will only be able to successfully learn Tafsir if they have a teacher for Tafsir. Just like that, they'll only really be able to learn Tazkiyah and purification of the Qalb and make that journey for Qalbun Salim if we have a teacher for Qalbun Salim. And the Zikr that our Mashaikh taught us is as follows. Number one, every day to recite Qur'an. Every single day we should recite Qur'an. Because if you're connected to Kalam Allah, you'll be connected to Allah SWT. If you're disconnected from Kalam Allah, distant from Kalam Allah, you will be disconnected and distant from Allah SWT. We guarantee If you can recite one juz, if you have more time, recite half a juz. You can't recite half a juz, recite quarter juz, recite however much you're able. Second thing is a hundred times a day to make a stick follow. Every day to scrub. Imagine that person who takes hundred showers a day. Every day. Going to get clean. Every day to scrub away at those sins. To scrub away at the sickness and sins in the heart. Every <coughs> single day. But you have to make the istighfar as feeling. If you think of istighfar, you should either remember some sin, and try to wipe it away. Or you can address it to a whole feeling of sin. Allah Ta'ala make us take far for the feeling of lust, the feeling of envy, the feeling of arrogance. Or you can make us take far for a category of sin. What does it mean? Allah Ta'ala ask your forgiveness for whatever sins I did in my life which caused me to misfudge Allah Ta'ala I ask your forgiveness for whatever sins I did in my life that made me have this uncontrollable anger. You have to do it with the feeling. Third thing is hundred times salawat, the rule of the Prophet Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa barik wa sallam but with feeling. Aad ko loog swarte ke baghair dil se dhirur se pardna ke wird hum karte hai. They come, say me hazaar dhirur se pardna ke wird hum karte hai. Rose. I say, aapne kitna dhirur se pardna. How many did you feel? Krishna. Maybe they felt ten out of a thousand. Yes? Yeh koi kamaan hai. Kya ab nabi ek dhru par far far par dhru shi par sakte hai khasar ke saam. Is se tas kya nahi hota. Yeh ghalat fehmi hai dhoho ki. Ah, jo dhru dil se pardte te, or dil se hinaar pardte te, to woh baas unka tas kya hota tha. Agar jab aap dil se nahi pardte te, to tas kya kya se hota. Heartless dhru. Heartfelt. A hundred times a day, but with feeling. What is the feeling? Feeling of love for Sayyidina Rasulullah Feeling of sending a gift to Sayyidina Rasulullah 
feeling of renewing my identity. If he is my Nabi, I am his Ummati. That feeling. Fourth thing, fourth zikr, is that whenever you're not doing Ibadah, whenever you're in the bazaar, whenever you're in the university, whenever you're in the shop, whenever you're in the office, whenever you're driving, when you're with family, when you're shopping, so much of our life is spent outside about it. All that time, you should still be thinking some thoughts about Allah SWT and some feelings for Allah SWT. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. Always be thinking thoughts about Allah SWT to always be feeling some feelings for Allah SWT. And this you have to do thousands of times a day. Thousands of times. All the time. And no matter what you're doing, keep trying to think about Allah SWT. No matter what you're doing, you should keep trying to feel some feelings for Allah SWT. And the fifth and final zikr is called zikr al-kalbi called Marakaba. It means that in your heart for 15, 10, 15, 20 minutes a day, you should try to do zikr of Allah Ta'ala's name. Allah Ta'ala said in Qur'an, وَذْكُرْ لَبَّكَ فِي نَفْسِكَ And remember your love inside of yourself. To love Allah with humility. Khifat and silently, secretly. And the way to remember Him, وَذْكُرْ إِسْمَ رَبِّكَ وَتَبَتَّلْ إِلَيْهِ تَبْدِيلًا Remember the name of your love, the name of our Rabb is Allah. وَتَبَتَّلْ إِلَيْهِ تَبْدِيلًا And disconnect yourself from everything and connect yourself to Him. Inshallah, after Shri Salah, we'll make Nawa. We'll make a short zikr and we'll make Nawa after Shri Salah. Praise Allah.